Hello and welcome to Intermediate Financial Accounting 2, Tutorial 19A. This is the first in a series of tutorials focused on preparation of the Statement of Cash Flows. This tutorial will illustrate how to prepare the Operating Activities section of the Statement of Cash Flows using the indirect method. This tutorial has three main learning objectives. The first will be to prepare the Operating Activities section of the Statement of Cash Flows using the indirect method. Second, to identify relevant non-cash adjustments to net income and to identify changes in working capital accounts, i.e. current assets and current liabilities. This tutorial is based on the McCoy Limited example, so please make sure that you have downloaded it and previewed the information. There's basically a balance sheet, an income statement, and some additional information. And the first requirement is going to be Again, using the indirect method to prepare the Statement of Cash Flows Operating Activities section only for this piece for the year ended December 31st, 2020. First thing we do is we start with net income. What I have here is just an excerpt of the income statement and the net income from the income statement is $120,000. That becomes the starting place. And this is only for the indirect method. Then what we do is we look at our income statement for any non-cash items, okay? So these are adjustments that are included in the net income that are not cash related. This blue area here corresponds to those items in the income statement. So we have depreciation expense and amortization expense for 8,000 and 2,000. So we add those back. Then we also will look at other revenues and expenses that include equity income from an in investment and associate. The associate had earned some positive net income and uh, McCoy has recorded its proportionate share of that income, but no cash is received. So that's why it's non-cash item. If you look at this item here, we are subtracting 61,250 because it's included in net income and should not be. Then we have a loss on sale of equipment and a loss on sale of FVNI investments. The loss on equipment is $4,000 that's included in net income, we must add that back to our net income. And then we have the $3,500 loss on sale of FVNI investments that also needs to be added back. So basically you see what we do is we add back non-cash expenses like depreciation, amortization, we add back non-cash losses and subtract non-cash gains. Now I've included one other item here just for illustration purposes. You'll see that there's an unrealized gain on land investment that's included in the other comprehensive income section, but that's in other comprehensive income. And you'll notice here that we do not start our net cash flow statement with comprehensive income. We start with net income, which is actually before the comprehensive income. This unrealized gain on land investment doesn't even belong here. I've just shown it for illustration purposes to show that we don't include it or that it's at zero here in our reconciliation. Now we're going to look at this green area here where we start to deal with any changes in operating capital or operating working capital and that's comprised of current assets and current liabilities. So here we've got our current assets and here we have our current liabilities and you notice I'll just draw that here to dividends. Even though dividends is a current liability, because dividends are related to common shares, it actually belongs in the financing section. After we do our non-cash adjustments for expenses that are included in net income, we now look at changes in our current asset and current liability accounts. The other thing here is that even though cash is a current asset, we don't actually include it in the statement of cash flows until the end when we reconcile it out. The only items that we're actually concerned with are these three right here because those are the current assets and then in this section that follows down here, these are non-current assets. So we see that accounts receivable went from 48,000 to 57,000. That's an increase in accounts receivable and that's actually an outflow for cash. What happens is when current assets increase, the cash goes down. Conversely, when the current assets decrease, the cash goes up. Let's look at that in this next piece here, in inventory. So inventory went from 94,000 to 82,000. Let's say that it was something really simple where we returned inventory to a supplier. Well, if we purchase inventory from a supplier and pay for it for cash, it makes sense then that the inventory goes up and the cash goes down. 
Well, in this case, if we say that we returned inventory to a supplier for cash, then the inventory goes down and the cash goes up by $12,000 because they gave us our money back. Prepaid expenses went from 7000 to 6000 That's a $1,000 change, so it's a decrease. So we're going to add that $1,000 back. That's it for the current assets. Now we look at the current liabilities, and we do the same thing, but the effect is the opposite. If we look at accounts payable, accounts payable went from 15000 to 33000 for an increase in 18000 and that's actually an increase in cash. If you have trouble with that, think about it the other way. If the accounts payable goes down, that means you are using cash to pay the supplier. If accounts payable goes down, cash goes down. If accounts payable goes up, you're not paying your supplier, so you're not using cash to pay your supplier. So the effect of current liabilities is opposite. As current liabilities go up, then cash goes up. Or if current liabilities goes down, cash goes down. With current assets, if current assets increase, the cash will decrease. And if current assets decrease, cash will increase. If we look at our unearned revenues, unearned revenues went from 3,800 to 17,200 for an increase of 13,400. Well, this makes sense because unearned revenues are amounts received from customers in advance. They're giving us money before we do it. So unearned revenue goes up, cash goes up. And the same for salaries payable. It went from 35,000 to 44,800. So a $9,800 increase in cash related to salaries payable. Interest payable dropped from 3,000 to 1,200, so it dropped by 1,800. That means we've paid interest, so that's subtracted. And then finally, income tax payable goes from 4,200 to 7,000. We owe tax, but we haven't paid it, so that is an increase. So when all is said and done, when we take our $120,000 net income and we add all of our changes, so the net changes between non-cash items and changes in working capital net out to 2,450, the net cash flows from operating activities are $122,450. So this is cash generated from operating activities. Now, what I'm going to do here is I'm just introducing one little piece that uh, we'll see later on. When it comes to the indirect approach, we must include a supplemental disclosure for two things. One, cash paid for interest and two, cash paid for income taxes. These are very important. It is a requirement under both IFRS and ASPE that we show the actual cash paid for interest and income taxes. Now, it's important to note that cash paid for interest is not the same as interest expense. The interest expense is on the income statement, but just because we expense it does not mean that's the amount we actually pay in cash. So to show the cash paid for interest, we look at the income statement first and say, okay, we have $9,000 in interest expense plus a change in interest payable. When it comes to income taxes, we look at the income statement and say, okay, there is a $27,000 expense, but the income tax payable increased. So we actually paid $24,200. Just because the income tax expense is $27,000, we didn't pay all of it. There is an increase in income tax payable, means we owe some. So the cash paid for income taxes is actually $24,200. Very important when it comes to supplemental disclosures. Let's wrap up with some key points to remember. Under both IFRS and ASPE, the statement of cash flows can be prepared using either the indirect or direct approaches. However, the direct method is actually preferred. And the reason why it's preferred, as you'll see perhaps later on, is that it actually provides more meaningful information to users. We must also include supplemental disclosures for any cash paid for interest and income taxes. Now, again, that's not the same as any interest expense or income tax expense from the income statement. We have to add to those changes in the related balance sheet accounts. Next, when it comes to the indirect method, we always begin with any net income or any loss. Then we add any non-cash depreciation, amortization, and any other non-cash expenses or losses. Usually these are the only ones, depreciation, amortization, and losses are typically the only non-cash expenses you'll see. We subtract non-cash gains. Then we start to look at changes 
in the balance sheet. So if we look at decreases in assets, we will add decreases in assets. We will subtract increases in current assets. We will add back increases in liabilities, in current liabilities, and we will subtract decreases in current liabilities. And the reason why we do that is because of this little green box here, the, the relationship. So the asset cash relationship is the opposite, whereas the liability cash relationship is the same. So this concludes tutorial 19A. You should review tutorial 19B for preparation of the operating activity section using the direct method. And then you should proceed to tutorial 19C for the preparation of the investing activity section of the cash flow statement.